In this video, we are going to be talking about fear, the uncanny valley, aliens, body horror, and just generally creepy stuff. If this is something that makes you uncomfortable, then you might want to skip this video. But if you're comfortable engaging with this conversation, then welcome. I also just want to list a quick spoiler warning for the following H.P. Lovecraft stories. The Shadow Over Innsmouth, the Whisperer in Darkness, and the Statement of Randolph Carter. With that out of the way, let's get started. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Howard Phillips Lovecraft is known for composing some of the darkest and most chilling science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. His works have been retold and added onto and have inspired countless other writers of horror. But if there are so many other horror stories to tell, why have we held on so long to the works of a demonstrably terrible man? What makes the Cthulhu mythos such a deep-set and widespread part of our cultural consciousness? The fiction of H.P. Lovecraft is scary, but so is a lot of other stuff. That's the entire point of Halloween. So what is it exactly that sets Lovecraft's work apart? What makes the stories of H.P. Lovecraft so scary? Well, most people would say that it's the fear of the unknown, an idea that Lovecraft himself agreed with. The unknown, he said, is the greatest source of our greatest emotion. But the phrase fear of the unknown is actually a little bit misleading. See, it's not just the unknown that's so scary. Well, it isn't just the unknown. <laughs> it's the fear of the unknown within the known. It's the fear of the unfamiliar within the familiar. It's the mismatch between reality and memory, between what you're experiencing now and what you've experienced in the past. In other words, it's the uncanny. So what is the uncanny? Well, the uncanny is an almost unidentifiable sense of dread and uncertainty. It's the feeling that something is off, but you can't quite put your finger on it. It's the inability to tell whether something is familiar or unfamiliar. Do I recognize this thing? Do I know if it's a threat? Do I know anything about it? So why does this happen? Well, our brains are lazy. They conserve energy as much as possible. Being presented with new information can be a pretty energy-hungry process. Because of this, our brains try to find familiarity within everything we see. That's why we see faces in objects and why we see patterns everywhere. We want new things to relate as much as possible to things we already know about. Because if they are like things we already know about, then we know what to expect from them. To make this easier on ourselves, we tend to subconsciously make a lot of assumptions. We see something that looks like an apple. We assume it is an apple. We know what apples are. <laughs> we have had experiences with apples. We know what to expect from apples. We know what they look and feel and taste like. Our brain has a box full of information about apples. So if we come across something new, but that fits within the category of Apple, we already have a ton of information about it without having to take any risks or learn anything new. So we learn to like the familiar, the known. 
The easier it is to categorize our perceptions and experiences, the less stress we put on our brains, the fewer negative emotions we feel, and the more comfortable we are. In other words, the more easily that things fit into our brain's boxes of information, the happier we are. So what does this mean for the uncanny? Well, the uncanny occurs when something rides the line between categories. When we can't decide between two boxes or when we try to fit something into two opposing, mutually exclusive categories. This is where the real fear comes in. Most of us are familiar with the concept of the uncanny through the idea of the uncanny valley. The uncanny valley describes how comfortable we are with objects the closer they resemble people. We are comfortable with things that are definitely inhuman and things that are definitely human. But our comfort levels plummet when something is just in between the two. This dip is known as the uncanny valley. When an object blurs the line between human and inhuman, we can't decide which box it should go in on our brains, and our brains are not very happy about that. There's another similar concept of the uncanny, that of liminal spaces. When we're presented with a liminal space, we're shown something familiar in an unfamiliar setting, like a playground at night or an abandoned mall. We have boxes that we can place those familiar things into, different settings that they can fit comfortably and normally within. But if we're presented with those familiar things in an unfamiliar setting, we're totally unprepared. We don't have a box for that. So what makes this scary? Why does the uncanny, this combination of known and unknown, freak us out so much? When our brains are comfortable with a thing, and especially when we have positive associations with that thing, we let our guard down. We see something that looks like an apple, and based on what we know about apples, we know that we don't have to worry about it. It wouldn't even cross our minds to be afraid of an apple. We trust the apple. The fear comes when the familiar, known thing betrays that trust. When the apple, the thing that we're comfortable with, becomes unfamiliar, then our brains go into panic mode. What's even worse is when that betrayal of trust doesn't really have a resolution. When not only does the object not fit into the category we thought it fit into, but it doesn't fit within any known category. Both liminal spaces and the uncanny valley do this to us. They present us with something that's almost normal. Our brains want to think the thing that we're looking at is normal, but then we realize it's not normal. We realize it's something else entirely, something new, something unknown, and that's terrifying. When we see something uncanny, we're given something almost known. We're given something that appears to fit in one box, but then reveals that it never fit in that box to begin with, leaving us without a catalog of information about it, leaving us with nothing. Nothing except our imaginations. If the apple could do that, what else could it do? What other unknown qualities could it have? The answer could be anything. So where does this fit within the writing of H.P. Lovecraft? How is the uncanny used in his stories to evoke uncertainty and fear and dread? Well, it's everywhere. Almost all of the scares, scares in these stories, are in the uncanny. You know something is going to go wrong. It's a horror story after all. It's just, you're never certain what exactly is going to go wrong. The pin has to drop, the dominoes have to fall, but what pushes them? 
The monsters in these stories are certainly uncanny. And I don't just mean the almost natural beasts of gargantuan size and mind-melting abilities like Cthulhu or the Shoggoths. No, I mean the monsters that you never see. The monsters that exist only in shadows, half visible and barely heard. The monsters you can only imagine. The monsters that are really unknown. In The Shadow Over Innsmouth, our main character visits the sleepy old fishing town as a secondary stop on his way elsewhere. He's told stories about this town, stories of people going missing, of disease and misfortune striking the townsfolk, and of the mysterious cults who worship dark aquatic beings. But he goes to Innsmouth anyway, and when he gets there, he finds that all of those stories are true. The townsfolk are ugly, odd people. Their heads and bodies are misshapen, and they sort of shamble when they walk, often staring into a vague middle distance with cloudy eyes. They look and act almost human, but not quite. The most unnerving or uncanny sight for our protagonist occurs when he passes a church near the center of town. Here, he sees the pastor of the church just briefly out of the corner of his eye. The door of the church basement was open, revealing a rectangle of blackness inside. And as I looked, a certain object crossed or seemed to cross that dark rectangle, burning into my brain a momentary conception of nightmare, which was all the more maddening because analysis could not show a single nightmarish quality in it. It was a living object, and had I been in a steadier mood, I would have found nothing whatever of terror in it. Clearly, as I realized a moment later, it was the pastor, clad in some peculiar vestments. The thing which had probably caught my first subconscious glance and supplied the touch of bizarre horror was the tall tiara he wore. This, acting on my imagination, had supplied namelessly sinister qualities to the indeterminate face and robed, shambling form beneath it. There was not, I soon decided, any reason why I should have felt that shuddering touch of evil pseudo-memory. This is a single but powerful example of the terror of the uncanny. The terror of the combination of familiar and unfamiliar, known and unknown. Pastors and churches are a familiar sight, especially in 1920s New England. So too was our narrator aware of the odd tiara that the pastor was wearing, since he had seen a similar one just the day before in a museum. The combination of these things, of seeing a pastor wearing vestments associated with a dark and mysterious cult, seeing a cult's relic outside a museum and in a church, no less, that is disconcerting. It catches you off guard, makes you do a double take. That surprise or feeling of betrayal even, of the subversion of your expectations, is made all the worse when you are unable to clarify your thoughts, to reanalyze the information and realize, oh yeah, okay, so it wasn't what I thought, but okay, now I do know what's going on. See, not only was there a combination of known and unknown when our protagonist caught the glimpse of the odd cult pastor, but he was never actually able to resolve that uneasiness. The church was dark, the pastor simply walked in front of the doorway, and then he was gone. There was nothing to see, no way to confirm or debunk what the protagonist had thought he had seen. If seeing something uncanny makes you ask the question, if this isn't what I thought it was, then what is it and what could it do? Then darkness, obfuscation, and secrecy make it impossible to find that answer. There's no more information. There's nothing else to go on. There's just the question. And that is what makes these stories so frightening. What makes the uncanny even more terrifying is when you're given 
just enough information. Not enough to really know what something is, but enough to know what it could do. When you never see the monster, but you see what it leaves in its wake. In The Whisperer in Darkness, our protagonist, Albert Wilmarth, a professor of literature, is researching tales of monstrous, alien, almost human creatures that lived hidden in the hills of Vermont. As part of his research, he corresponds with Henry Ackley, an amateur studier of folklore who has been gathering information about these alien creatures. We're told secondhand our information filtered first through Ackley and then through Wilmarth, all about these alien creatures. We're told how they communicate in this guttural, buzzing speech, speech far from human and yet speaking in perfect, precise, scholarly English. We're told how these creatures sometimes leave footprints in the muddy Vermont earth, but whose prints always seem to mysteriously vanish before they can be photographed or shown to an authority. How they meet in cult-like gatherings along with others, humans, who are spies for the creatures, gathering information and acting as liaisons between the aliens and the inhabitants of the sleepy Vermont town. We're told how you can hear them buzzing around your house at night, hear them clawing at your window, how you know they are watching you at all times, but you're never able to actually see them. Not clearly, anyway, not in the light, not fully. They, the unknown, are infiltrating our known reality, our town, our home, even our friends and family. See, by the end of the story, our protagonist Wilmarth has been asked to visit by Ackley. Mind you, this was after Ackley was supposedly attacked by the aliens and then went silent for a while, so you be the judge of that. Wilmarth takes a train and eventually a taxi up from Arkham, Massachusetts to Townsend, Vermont. He makes his way to Ackley's home, bringing all the information he's collected on the creatures so that he and Ackley can pour over it together. However, upon reaching the house, he finds the farmland eerily quiet. No livestock, no dogs, no sounds even from birds. Wilmarth also finds Ackley very ill, due, Ackley says, to a bout of asthma attacks. Ackley is so ill, in fact, that he's bundled up from head to toe. He has a strained, rigid, immobile expression and unwinking glassy stare, along with limp, lifeless, lean hands resting in his lap. When he speaks, he speaks in a hoarse, hacking whisper and his lips barely move, and he emits a strange, foul odor. Ackley even offers Wilmarth some coffee, but the smell is acrid and burnt and wrong. He declines the drink. Our protagonist senses that something is wrong, but he can't quite put his finger on it. He knows it's too quiet. He knows his sick host is acting odd. He knows there was something off about the food and drink, but there's nothing more than a feeling. Nothing more than something isn't right. Nothing more than something is here which doesn't belong. That is, until the night of his escape from the farmhouse. See, Ackley tells Wilmarth several things about the alien creatures, who he says didn't mean to harm him in the attacks, they just simply wanted to share their vast stores of knowledge with humanity. He says the alien creatures can travel through space, and that they have the technology to transfigure humans into forms that are able to travel alongside the creatures, a form that is, in essence, a brain in a jar. Ackley tells Wilmarth that the next day, the alien creatures would prepare the two men for interstellar travel, and that they, Ackley and Wilmarth, would be privy to the secrets of the universe. Wilmarth goes to bed that night understandably overwhelmed with this information. After overhearing a frightening conversation during the night which wakes him, Wilmarth plans his escape. He knows he has to get out of the house. Something in that fragmentary discourse has chilled me immeasurably, he says. 
raised the most grotesque and horrible doubts and made me wish fervently that I might wake up and prove everything a dream. I think my subconscious mind must have caught something which my consciousness has not yet recognized. So he leaves. He grabs his coat and his hat, silently opens the bedroom door, creeps down the hallway, down the steps. Being a thoughtful man, even through his fear, he tries to find Ackley, hoping to wake him and flee the place together. Ackley is not in the downstairs bedroom, however, where Wilmarth was expecting to find him. So he searches the study, the room where he and Ackley had sat and talked, the room where Ackley had revealed to him the secrets of the aliens. Flashlight in hand, he searches. From the table, I turned my flashlight to the corner where I thought Ackley was, but found to my perplexity that the great easy chair was empty of any human occupant, sleeping or awake. From the seat to the floor, there trailed voluminously the familiar old dressing gown, and near it on the floor lay the yellow scarf and huge foot bandages I had thought so odd. As I hesitated, striving to conjecture where Ackley might be and why he had so suddenly discarded his necessary sick room garments, I observed that the queer odor and sense of vibration were no longer in the room. What had been their cause? Curiously, it occurred to me that I had noticed them only in Ackley's vicinity. I paused, letting the flashlight wander about the dark study, and racking my brain for an explanation of the turn affairs had taken. Would to heaven I had quietly left the place before allowing that light to rest again on the vacant chair. As it turned out, I did not leave quietly, but with a muffled shriek. That shriek is the last sound I ever heard in that morbidity-choked farmhouse beneath the black wooded crest of a haunted mountain. That focus of transcosmic horror amidst the lonely green hills and curse-muttering brooks of a spectral rustic land. It is a wonder I did not drop my flashlight, ballast, and revolver in my wild scramble, but somehow I failed to lose any of these. I actually managed to get out of that room and that house without making any further noise, to drag myself and my belongings safely into the old Ford and the shed, and to set that archaic vehicle in motion towards some unknown point of safety in the black, moonless night. But that is all. If my sanity is still unshaken, I am lucky. As I have implied, I let my flashlight return to the vacant easy chair after its circuit of the room. Then noticing for the first time the presence of certain objects in the seat, made inconspicuous by the adjacent loose folds of the empty dressing gown. These are the objects, three in number, which the investigators did not find when they came later on. As I said at the outset, there was nothing of actual visual horror about them. The trouble was in what they led one to infer. Even now I have my moments of half-doubt, moments in which I accept the skepticism of those who attribute my whole experience to dream and nerves and delusion. The three things were damnably clever constructions of their kind, and were furnished with ingenious metallic clamps to attach them to organic developments, of which I dare not form any conjecture. I hope, devoutly hope, that they were the waxen products of a master artist, despite what my inmost fears tell me. <laughs> Great God, that whisperer in darkness with its morbid odor and vibrations, sorcerer, emissary, changeling, outsider, that hideous repressed buzzing and all the time in that fresh, shiny cylinder on the shelf. <laughs> Poor devil, prodigious, surgical, biological, chemical, and mechanical skill. For the things in the chair, perfect to the last subtle detail of microscopic resemblance or identity, were the face and hands of Henry Wentworth Ackley. Everything he knew, or thought he knew, about Henry Ackley, about the town of Townsend and the alien creatures who inhabited it, suddenly became unknown. Into that sleepy farmhouse, an old and comfortable sort of place, was inserted the most horrific kind of body horror. If Ackley wasn't Ackley, 
what else here isn't what it seems? What else is wrong and broken and alien and unknown? When you don't actually know what you thought you knew, you suddenly question everything. I want to leave you with one final example of the uncanny. A story whose monster is never seen, and a story whose protagonist goes mad anyway. A story whose ending, well, you'll see. In the statement of Randolph Carter, the titular man stands trial for the death of his friend Harley Warren. The story is comprised of Randolph's recounting of the events that lead to his friend's death. See, Harley is dead, and we're told this at the outset, just five sentences into the story. We just don't know exactly how he met that fate. In any other horror story, we wouldn't know of his death until the end. It would be the climax. It would be the moment in the slasher film where the big bad comes in, axe swinging, and hacks through the back of the best friend. But that's not what happens in the statement of Randolph Carter. No, instead we're told that our main character hopes his friend is in peaceful oblivion after the horrors of that awful night. Throughout the tale, we're told of Harley's deep, dark research into deep, dark things. We're told of how he asked our protagonist, Randolph, to come with him to explore an ancient cemetery full of unknown things. We're told only vagaries of what his research was about, and like Randolph, our minds are left to fill in the blanks. Our protagonist is left at the surface as Harley ventures down into a catacomb, descending stairs set in the ground that lead deep into the earth, taking with him only a communication device, a light, and his ancient book of secrets. Randolph, and we the reader, can only imagine what Harley sees as he reaches the unknown, unknowable place. Even Harley struggles to capture in words the things he sees. All we know is that it's something terrible and monstrous. It isn't until the very end of the story that we're told what actually happened on that night. And even then, we never know what kind of fate met Harley Warren. All we're told is that eventually Harley saw something awful and grotesque and monstrous, and he told Randolph to run, to close up the crypt behind him, to leave Harley to his fate. But what fate? What happened? Randolph is never told, and so we never know. Frozen in fear, our protagonist stays on his end of the receiver, listening to the cries of his friend as he tells Randolph over and over to leave, and then... there's nothing. After that was silence. I know not how many interminable aeons I sat, stupefied, whispering, muttering, calling, screaming into that telephone. Over and over again, through those aeons, I whispered and muttered, called, shouted, and screamed, Warren, Warren, answer me, are you there? And then came to me the crowning horror of all. The unbelievable, unthinkable, almost unmentionable, thing. I've said that aeons seemed to elapse after Warren shrieked forth his last despairing warning, and that only my own cries now broke the hideous silence. But after a while, there was a further clicking in the receiver, and I strained my ears to listen. Again, I called down, Warren, are you there? And in answer, heard the thing which has brought this cloud over my mind. I do not try, gentlemen, to account for that thing, that voice, nor can I venture to describe it in detail, since the first words took away my consciousness and created a mental blank which reaches to the time of my awakening in the hospital. Shall I say the voice was deep, hollow, gelatinous, remote, unearthly, inhuman, disembodied? What shall I say? It was the end of my experience and is the end of my story. I heard it and knew no more. Heard it as I sat petrified in that unknown cemetery in the hollow, amidst the crumbling stones and the falling tombs, the rank vegetation and miasmal vapors. Heard it well up 
from the innermost depths of that damnable open sepulchre as I watched amorphous necrophagous shadows dance beneath an accursed waning moon. And this is what it said. You fool. One is dead. The most frightening parts of Lovecraft stories aren't the giant monsters or sacrificial death cults. No, the frightening parts are the most mundane. The terror is in the quiet, misty hills of Vermont, in the people who look or act not quite right, in the glimpses of movement in the shadows, in the startling realizations, the sudden awareness that something isn't as simple or ordinary as you thought. The sudden and uncomfortable newness is what is captured in the unknown. When Lovecraft said that fear of the unknown is the strongest kind of fear, he meant the uncanny, the surprising, the weird things that make you do a double take. The realization that what you thought you knew isn't actually what you're being faced with. And he was right. It is frightening, uncomfortable, disconcerting, terrifying, scary as fuck. Our brains don't like to be confronted with that kind of stuff. So why is it that so many of Lovecraft's stories place characters in these positions? And why do so many of the characters knowingly and willingly seek out these uncanny experiences? What happens when you're given the answer to the question of what is reality? What is actually happening here? What is this thing? When you question the uncanny. What happens if you were to learn the unlearnable or to know the unknown. Well, you'll have to stick around to find out. This video was made possible by the paycheck from my college administration, who won't let me teach the way that I want, which is why I am making these videos in the first place. And by viewers like you, who donate to my Patreon, linked in the description below. Thank you.